Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, I'm honored today to have Eric Baumer joining us from University of California, Irvine, where he is a PhD candidate. His dissertation work is on uh, computational metaphors, a different interesting area, but here he's going to be reflecting on the last couple of years of research he's been doing on blogs and blog reading. That started off while a Microsoft intern working with me and uh, is now joining us today to talk about blog reading and blog readers. I'd like to welcome uh, Eric Baumer. Eric? <clears throat> Thanks, Danielle. Um, <clears throat> As Daniel said, I'm coming from the University of California, Irvine. The research that I'm, I'm going to be talking about today was conducted in the social code group there under the supervision of Bill Tomlinson. Um, it was also in large part with an undergrad researcher named Mark Suyoshi. And the, the basic gist of what we're looking at is that there's been a significant amount of research on blogs and blogging and social network analysis of blogs, but not so, much peop not so much research actually focusing on readers of blogs and how people read. Um, so this is sort of trying to explore the other side of blogging. I'll start off with, um, as, as Danielle mentioned, a project that I did here as an intern in the summer of 2006 called the Smarter Blog Role. Um, <clears throat> From that, I'll move on to talking about an exploratory study that we did of blog reading and blog reading practices that was recently presented as a paper at CHI. Um, and I'll wrap up with a study that we actually just completed focusing on people who read political blogs. So the, the smarter blog role, um, and this was, this was presented earlier this, earlier this year in a, a paper at the Hicks conference in the Social Spaces mini track. We started off with this idea of sort of ambient chatter or, or the zeitgeist, trying to capture what are the current hot topics that people are talking about. If, if, you, if you want to talk about the entire blogosphere, then there are things like Technorati tag clouds and other tools that capture it for, for sort of everything. But there aren't really tools that are, that are specifically aimed at what are the blogs I read talking about? What are the people in, whom I, in whose opinions I'm interested? What do they think is cool right now? And so we developed this tool called the Smarter Blog Role that is essentially socially scoped topic extraction. It's applying a really simple TF-IDF weighted bigrams and trigrams to an individual's blog role. And you can see over here a, a screen cap of the, the tool itself. You have, just like in a traditional blog role, individual blogs, Alabama Improper, Alt House, et cetera. Underneath those, those are augmented with lists of automatically identified topics. Let's say someone was interested in this mystery guest blogger topic on Alabama Improper. They click on that, and then they can go directly to posts about that topic. Um, and this was, this was designed specifically with two tasks in mind. One of them is the monitoring my list task looking at the list of blogs that I read and keeping up with them. The other task that we had in mind is sort of understanding another person's list. If I come across a new blog and I see the blog roll down the side and it's a whole bunch of alien names that I've never heard before, that doesn't tell me a lot about that blog or that person's interests. With this, you can quickly skim through the list of topics and get a sort of general idea of what that person is interested in. So to evaluate this, we did a, a user study where we took two sample blog roles. <clears throat> and these were, these were taken from actual blogs and hand generated a list of topics for those blog roles. For, for each blog role, we came up with 10 actual topics that were actually discussed in posts somewhere on the blog roles, as well as 20 distractors. And the task that we gave people was to sort of skim through this blog roll over the course of 10 minutes and then identify which out of these 30 topics were actually discussed 
in, the, in that blog roll. Um, participants were then scored on the number of correct hits, the number of correct topics that they accurately identified, as well as false positives, the number of things that they thought were talked about but actually were not. Um, a simple two by two study design where we varied which blog role they saw first and whether they had the smarter blog role first or the classic blog role first. As far as the results, there was an overwhelmingly significant result that people thought it was much easier, it was a much easier task to get an impression of these blog roles with the tool, as well as far more enjoyable. What was also interesting is that when we asked them if the, the topics that they saw were actually informative, people thought that they were if they saw the smarter blog role first. And we, we hypothesized that there's a sort of disappointment effect going on here in both directions. If you start with the smarter blog role, it's, it's a difficult task to try and skim through these, this long blog role and try and get a gist of what they're talking about in 10 minutes. But at least you've got these, these topics there. If you now go from the smarter blog role to the classic blog role, you don't have that assistance. And all you can think about is that you want those topics back. Now, if you change that order and the people start with the classic blog role, it's a difficult task. But they're thinking through that whole 10 minutes, OK, I just have to get through this, and then I'll have the smarter version there, and it'll tell me the topics, and it'll be easier. And they get there, and the topics don't quite help them that much. And so there's a disappointment factor going the other direction, too. Um, <clears throat> and this sort of leads into the 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 interesting result that there was actually no difference in task performance between whether people had the smarter blog role or the classic blog role. They had the same number of correct hits and the same number of false positives. Um, and there, there are sort of a number of important takeaways from that. One of them is that People were generally pretty excited about the, the possibility of tools to help them read blogs. Um, but one of, the, one of the difficult things here was that we sort of tried to parameterize this browse task, trying to create a situation where people were getting the gist of a list of blogs. When during the study, what they ended up doing was looking at the list of topics that we gave them and doing a search task. So they would go to the first topic and say, OK, bicycles. Let me find a post about bicycles. And they, they sort of changed the task and didn't do it the way we had envisioned. Um, but a, another interesting point was as people were doing this, there was this sort of constant stream of talking that they would say, oh, well, this doesn't really match how I would read blogs. And I read my blogs this way. And I've, I've sort of got it split into these lists and all these various things. And this was, this was actually a really difficult problem. Because when we were in the process of designing this tool, we went back to the literature on blogging and said, OK, what has been done about people's reading practices? Because that's what we wanted to support, was people's blog reading practices. What we found out, much to our surprise, is that very little research had been done focusing specifically on blog readers. There was some work that mentioned blog readers and that mentioned that blog readers were an important part of blogging, but nothing specifically focusing on the readers. So the following summer, um, I did a study, an exploratory qualitative study, of blog reading practices. Um, <clears throat> excuse me for a second. And what, what was really interesting was there's, there's, a, there's a quote from um, Nardia et al.'s paper on blogging as a social activity, where they say that blogging is as much about reading as about writing. And future research is sure to pay attention to blog readers. And so, that's what we went and did. We tried to pay attention to the blog readers. Um, as I mentioned, this work was presented earlier this year in a paper at CHI. Um, but what we were doing was sort of an exploratory study, a qualitative study, trying to understand the, the role of the reader um, and how readers perceive bloggers' online presentation of self. 
And for this, this study, we were, we were trying, to un, trying to find a theoretical framework that would help us understand reading. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that we came across that was actually really useful was this idea from literary criticism of reader response theory. Um, and reader response theory argues that meaning is neither inherently in the text itself nor solely in the reader, but rather in the interactions between the two. And specifically, we were drawing on an essay by C.S. Lewis called An Experiment in Criticism, where he says, let us, let us sort of, rather than trying to judge good literature by the qualities or characteristics of the literature itself, let's see to what extent we can determine literature by the type of reading that people do. And he argues that good literature permits, invites, or even compels good reading. Now what we were doing wasn't trying to sort good blogs from bad blogs, but rather we were trying to look at blogs in terms of this sort of interactionist perspective. We wanted to ask, to what extent could you look at different types of blogs by the different types of interaction they invite, permit, or compel? Um, and another, another interesting point here is that reader response theory is all about interactions with the text. Well, blogging and other similar social media actually make such interactions explicit or they enable and allow explicit interaction with the text. So it seemed like a, a really apt theory for, for, or theoretical framework for what we wanted to do. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, this was a, a qualitative study informed very much by ethnographic methods. Most of the methods methodology was semi-structured, open-ended interviews. We also did a, a quick demographic survey about um, various blog reading practices and that sort of thing. Those, those interview transcripts were then analyzed using an iterative coding process where we started with open coding, just kind of looking for salient themes. And then once themes emerged, going back and rereading through the text and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so the, just a, a sort of quick profile of our participants for this study. We had 15 readers. 11 of them were female. Four were male. They were all recru recruited from the geographic area around UC Irvine, and so they were all either students, undergrads or grad students, or young professionals. The age ranged from 18 to 33 with an average of about 23.3. Um, but one of, the, one of the really interesting things was that despite the relative heterogeneity of this population in terms of demographics, their reading practices were very heterogeneous. That is, we had some people who only read two blogs regularly. Some people range all the way up into 20 or more blogs regularly. Some people would read only two to three times per week. Some people would read several times a day. Um, so just uh, to sort of outline of the, the findings that I want to talk about here, um, I'll go over sort of some of the, the common practices. What actually were common traits across most of our participants? Um, and then I'll talk about the, the different ways that people define and constitute the word blog. That it, it actually ended up being an, an incredibly multifarious term. Um, and then I'll talk about, I sort of alluded to this earlier, this idea of identity presentation and identity perception in online environments. And then the, the notion of being a part of the blogs that one reads. So in terms of common practices, one of the things that ran across all the participants to, to whom we spoke was that blog reading is incredibly habitual. It's routine. And one, one reader sort of compared it to email, that sometimes when you check your email, you're not necessarily expecting to actually have email. You just check it because that's what you do. Similarly, these people would go to, their, go to blogs to read blogs, not because they expected there to be new posts, but because it was part of their habit and part of their routine. Another, another interesting finding, um, there's a lot of rhetoric 
in information retrieval and social media about this notion of information overload. That there's simply too much information out there that we can't really wrap all our heads around it or grok all of it at once. Well, what was interesting is that of our, of our 15 participants, only two really felt that in terms of blog reading there was too much out there. Most participants didn't particularly feel overwhelmed or that there was too much information out there. If they miss a couple posts, eh, no big deal. They'd go back and read it if they had time. If they didn't have time, it, it wasn't the end of the world. People didn't feel like they were really particularly overwhelmed. Um, <clears throat> and that, that sort of, if you miss a couple posts, leads into this, this notion that we called non -crinous. So a lot of times, computer-mediated communication is distinguished between being synchronous communication or asynchronous communication. Um, and blogs are usually seen as closer to asynchronous, but it's not, that didn't really capture what we saw. So for example, let's say that one of our blog readers went out of town for two weeks and they came back and there were a dozen new posts on their blog, on, the, on one of the blogs that they read. Rather than going back and reading the posts over, say, the last day or the last week, they would read the top three posts. Whether or not those posts happened that same day, within the past week, or within the past month, it was that the order in which events happened and how many posts were made mattered a lot more than specifically when those posts were made. So it, it sort of challenges this notion. It's not that time date stamps aren't important, but it's not the first thing that people look at when they're determining how far back to read in their blogs. Um, and then the, the last thing that was common amongst a lot of participants was a lot of overloaded terminology, where the same word would mean lots and lots and lots of different things. So for example, the, people would use the term blog to refer to an entire blog hosting site, like LiveJournal or Zanga or MySpace. They would sometimes use the term blog to refer to an individual blog, as in a series of posts written by a single person. They would sometimes use the word blog to refer to a, a, an individual post, something like, oh, I read a blog that he wrote yesterday. Um, and, this, and this sort of brings up the question of, what is a blog? Usually the definitions that are, that are given in the literature are things in terms of structural or technical characteristics. So one of the canonical definitions is given in, in a paper by Susan Herring and a few other folks that a blog is a series of posts listed in reverse chronological order, given in frequent updates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when we asked our participants the, the sort of deceptively simple question, what is a blog? They would say things like, well, there's the technical term and my own definition. And then so we'd say, OK, well, when do you use which definition? And the, invariably, it was, it depends. Um, another, another participant, when we asked what a blog is, she responded the following way. A blog is something that's, that's still going on, that has a conversation going on, that has people commenting. It has this dialogue between the person who's posting and the people who are reading. And this, this is really reminiscent of this notion of an interactional definition, that blogging really is about an interaction between the reader and the text, or perhaps between the reader and the author. And we see this as sort of indicating that our choice of reader response theory in this context is particularly apt. <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of other. Um, Previous research in online social interaction has looked at the notion of presentation of self or presentation of online identity. And so what we wanted to do was, was ask the other side of the question. How do people perceive this, this online presented self? Well, one of, the, one of the important aspects of this was the notion of authenticity, that a lot of readers looked at <clears throat> bloggers as being something authentic 
or personal, whether or not they knew the person offline or not. Um, and that, that sort of brings up this, this question of online identity versus offline identity. Um, and it's, it's something that a lot of our, our readers really tackled with. There was, there was one participant in particular who always used a pseudonym. And there, there are lots of research papers describing similar things. Um, <clears throat> another, another aspect that a lot of previous researchers talked about is that bloggers feel an obligation or that they feel that there's a, a certain sort of expectations that readers have of them. Um, <clears throat> things like bloggers think that readers expect them to post regularly and have good content in their posts and regular updates and a sort of aesthetic, a, a pleasing visual style to their blog. And so what we wanted to say was, well, do people actually have that, those expectations? And what we found is that readers' expectations actually vary a lot largely along the lines of whether the blog they're reading is a large high traffic blog or whether it's uh, the blog of a close personal friend. If it's a large high traffic blog, they tend to have much higher expectations of the blogger than if it's a close personal friend. But what was also interesting here is that readers also felt obligations to bloggers. And that's something that hasn't really been, been talked about a lot in the, the previous research. One, one reader said that um, a, a good post deserves a good reply from the audience. That if the blogger takes the time to put something out there that's well thought out and well constructed, then the reader is obligated to comment back. And not just to leave a comment, but the comment needs to be well thought out and well constructed as well. <clears throat> and then the, the last theme that I want to I talk about here is this notion of being a part. And this was something that, that all our participants talked about in one way or another. That <clears throat> it, and it's not quite the idea of being a member of a community. It's more along the lines of belonging or, or this sense of participation. But what actually constitutes participation also varies widely. So one participant said that just by reading, I feel like I'm participating. She didn't have to comment or email the blogger to feel like she was really being a part of the blog. But that's not always the case. <clears throat> that there were other situations where one of our participants said that because he doesn't comment, he doesn't feel like he's a part of the blog, that commenting was essential for being a part of the blog. And again, this tended to vary along the lines of the reader's relationship with the blogger. If it was someone that the reader knew personally, then just reading constituted participation in the blog. If it was a large high traffic blog, then reading alone wasn't quite enough to create that, that sort of connection to the blogger. Um, <clears throat> but another, another interesting aspect about that is that connection changes over time. So for example, one of our participants read a blog that was largely commentary on pop culture and occasional sort of witty humorous excerpts from, from the news. But occasionally, the, the blogger would also post pictures of his cats. And the, the reader said, what's up with the cat posts? I mean, this isn't something that I really care about. I'm coming here for the, the humor and the entertainment value. I don't want to see your cats. But what happened over time is that as she read the blog progressively more and more, she sort of developed this closer sense of connection with the, with the blogger. So much so that the, the cat post stopped being annoying and actually became endearing. And they created this, this sort of close personal connection or feeling of a personal connection between the reader and the blogger without any sort of explicit interaction between the two. <clears throat> and the, the general point there is that a lot of this depends on the relationship between the blogger and the reader. And that relationship evolves and changes over time. 
So the, the last segment that I want to talk about today is a study that we, we actually just concluded and, and submitted a paper about focusing on people who read political blogs. Um, so there were, there were a couple reasons that we, we chose to follow up and look at specifically political blogs. One of them is that we wanted to understand more closely this relationship and interaction between the blogger and the readers. Um, <clears throat> we also wanted to look at the impact of reading beyond blogs. What happens when people are reading blogs and how does that translate into other spheres of interaction? And it seemed like political blogs, I mean, you could, you could choose sort of any specifically grounded, but political blogs seem particularly apt, given the, the current political climate in the US, to look at ways that interaction on blogs affects interaction in other places and vice versa. <clears throat> and so what we did is we selected one liberal blog and one conservative blog. We recruited a number of readers from, from each blog we had, and we ended up with five readers from each blog. And then we also did interviews with the bloggers from those blogs to understand the interaction from both sides. Um, and as I, as I said, this was just recently submitted. So I'll sort of give an overview of some of the, some of the salient findings. <clears throat> one of the, so what we found, one of the primary motivators for people was in, in reading political blogs was some form of interaction. Um, a lot of people read partially to stay informed and partially to engage in political debate and partially for entertainment value a lot of times. But really, it came down to interaction either with the blogger or with the other readers through comment sections. Um, <clears throat> And similar to our, our previous study, most people felt this sense of being a part of the blogs that they read. But in this context, a lot of people talked about that they felt that they as the individual were not a significant part of the blog. Um, and this is, this is particularly interesting because a number of our participants recounted specific episodes where they would email a blogger or make a comment on the blog and the blogger would then take the content from that email or blog and repost it as an update to their post and say, hey, this person wrote me with this great idea and I had to share it. And so readers really are having a significant impact, but yet they don't feel like they are. And there's, there's a sort of tension there. <clears throat> Another interesting aspect was that blog reading actually became sort of a, a form of political participation or for some people, almost a form of political activism. That <clears throat> we, we also asked participants about their, their general political involvement. And we had one person who worked as a poll worker, and another person who was very dedicated and, and drove around her precinct, putting information on people's doors about, here's your caucusing location, here's how the process works, et cetera, et cetera, trying to get people involved. But for the most part, our participants were not incredibly politically active. Some of them would donate or make campaign contributions. Some of them might write their representative. But it was an incredibly politically active group. But what we found is that the, that act of reading political blogs almost served as a surrogate for some other form of political participation. And one of our, one of our participants talked about this. And, and he said that, you know, I'm not, I'm not really the type of person who's going to go out to a rally or protest or picket somewhere. But I will read blogs, and I will engage in political debate that way. And so this, this online interaction sort of becomes a new form of political participation. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and the other, the other thing is that I want to use this as sort of an opportunity to question some of the, the analytic distinctions that we make when we're analyzing social interactions online. One of them is, is sort of the very question of bloggers versus readers um, and trying to put people into these different pots. So in the, the first study that I, 
talked about, or I guess, no, in the second study I talked about, the, the exploratory qualitative study with 15 participants from around UC Irvine, of those 15, um, 12 of them were also bloggers themselves. And then in, our, in the study that we did of political blog readers, we had, what was it, one of them was an active blogger. One of them has a blog but doesn't post frequently. One of them used to blog but doesn't really anymore. And one of them actually started blogging as a result of participating in our study, he said. Um, <clears throat> and what I want to question is this, this notion of trying to draw a clear distinction between bloggers and readers. And I think it might be more beneficial to look at it in terms of the types of activities that people are doing, that certain activities are writing oriented or reading oriented. So the person who's writing the post, it's obviously a writing oriented activity. But if that person is commenting on another blog post somewhere, there may be a reading aspect to it as well. <clears throat> Similarly, if someone is commenting on a blog, that's certainly a reader-oriented activity or a reading-oriented activity. They're doing it because they read the blog post and they're responding to it. But it's also a writing-oriented activity, not only in the fact that they actually have to compose a comment and actually write it, but that comment then goes and affects the tone and actually ends up shaping the blog. And so trying to make a clear distinction between what's writing and what's reading I'm not saying that you can't make that distinction, but it might not be as informative as looking at the various ways that all of these different activities sort of contribute to the, the collaborative co-construction of the blog by bloggers and readers together. And the other, the other distinction that I, that I kind of want to call into question is this notion of online versus offline. Um, <clears throat> Some of, the, some of the early work on online inter social interaction said that, well, people go online to be somebody else completely. Um, I'm thinking here partially of Sherry Turkle's work looking at multi-user dungeons, that people would go online and assume another persona or explore different aspects of their own personality. Excuse me. Um, and later, there was, there was other work that said that, well, there are some times that that's not the case, that people go online not to be somebody else, to, but to be themselves. And there's a, there's a study of the usage of the internet in Trini Trinidad and Tobago by um, Miller and Slater, where they say that these people don't go online to be somebody else. They go online to be Trini. Um, an important part of being Trini is this, this family connection. And so one of the things that they describe is that a mother who has a daughter that lives in London will go online in Trinidad, check the weather in London, and say, if it's going to rain, make sure you bring your umbrella. Because that's part of what being Trini is. It's connecting to your family. And so there, really, online is, is almost identical with who they are offline. Um, but what we see here is the, online and offline, in, in the studies that we've done around blog reading, they're not mutually exclusive, but they're not completely coincident either. Um, a lot of our blog readers would go through great lengths to obfuscate their identity, that they would comment with the same handle and the same made up email address every time so that the blogger would know who they were, but there was really no connection to who they were offline. Um, and others, it was, it was a much subtler negotiation. And the, the point that I want to get at with all this isn't that the distinction between online and offline is necessarily a bad distinction to make, but that making that distinction might actually be misleading and cause us to, in our analyses, miss important aspects of these interactions that are actually occurring. Um, and I want to suggest that we might think about developing different terminology or different conceptualizations or ways of thinking about it that go beyond simply online versus offline. So to wrap up, um, <clears throat> I really hope that 
that this study and studies like this are really the beginning of an exploration of notions of readers and readership in lots of other social media. So the studies that I've talked about have been specifically focusing on blog readers and readership and blogging, but you could look at readers of Flickr, the notion of readership on YouTube, or people who read Wikipedia. The people who read Wikipedia or use it as a reference, I'm not talking about the people who contribute, the authors, the people who just go and read articles. Do they necessarily know about the editing process behind this? Do they know what the administrative and governance procedures of Wikipedia are? There's been some research by um, Ed Chi from Park with a wiki dashboard trying to expose some of this. But I think it would be really interesting to do studies of people who read Wikipedia regularly. Um, another, another sort of important area or design area for tools that I think this opens up is tools aimed specifically at blog readers. Um, <clears throat> partially to sort of facilitate richer social interactions between bloggers and readers or richer interactions around blogging. That the tools they have right now are, are sort of impoverished and people do have rich interactions with the tools that are there, but I think there's, there's sort of a space to open that up and, and explore what other types of interactions can you have there. Um, and then the, the other space that I think is really open there is, I talked a little bit about how blog reading in our first study was very much habitual or routinized. Um, what was interesting is that a lot of participants were very reflective about why they read blogs, about their motivations, but they weren't as reflective about how they read or what they read. And I think there's a really neat space there for tools to sort of encourage reflection of blog readers, partially on their own practices and habits of blog reading, but partially to get them to read between the words and behind the words and sort of encourage them to go out of this habitual routine process and make it more of an engaging read. <clears throat> one of the, and so one of the tools that, that I'm working on along the lines of this, and this sort of goes back to the, the line of research that Danielle had mentioned at the beginning, is um, <clears throat> in the area of trying to computationally identify conceptual metaphors that are, that are in a written text. So if you think about the way that that we talk about having an argument, that you attack someone's position or you defend your point or she obliterated her opponent. The words and the language that we use evince, the, evince these images of combat and war. Um, <clears throat> and there's work by uh, Lakoff and Johnson and lots of other folks saying that this is actually evidence of a conceptual metaphor, that we frame our experience of being in an argument in terms of being at war with someone. <clears throat> And so a large portion of the, 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 dissert, the dissertation research that I'm actually doing is working on computational methods of taking large bodies of text and identifying what conceptual metaphors are being used here. Um, <clears throat> and what I, what I want to do is take that and apply it in the context of political blogs to sort of encourage this critical reflection and critical engagement with the text to, to draw people out, to encourage discussions about what conceptual metaphors are being used here. What does this metaphor highlight or draw out? What aspects of the same situation does that metaphor hide or downplay? And what's a different metaphor you might use to conceptualize the same situation? Um, <clears throat> also, just a, a really quick plug. I'm going to be around for today and part of tomorrow. I know I'm meeting with some folks, but if anyone else is interested in chatting, I've got a little time tomorrow afternoon. Just come up after the talk and let me know. Um, just some quick acknowledgments. The, the one that I want to call out of this is the, the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology and their summer undergraduate funding program in information technologies. Um, they funded Mark Tsuyoshi during last summer and really without their support, none of this research would have been possible. So I really want to thank them. Um, I'll go ahead and open it up for questions now 
And those of you watching via the webcast in your offices, you can email Danielle questions, Danielle F, and he will relay them to me. So thank you again, and I'll take your questions now. Statistics of how many people participate versus just read, you know, actively in terms of percentage. So that I think is actually a really important area for work. All the studies that we've done so far have been small qualitative studies. They're not statistical, they're not quantitative. I I think it's really important and it's an open area for research. Um, if anybody's looking for, for a project, I might suggest doing that. Um, <clears throat> But I, I unfortunately don't have statistics. I know that there's, I know that there is something called the Blog Readers Project, which allows bloggers to post surveys on their site and get demographic information about their blog, about their readers. But I don't believe that that's actually focused on interaction or trying to explore how many of these themes generalize to a very broad-ranging blog reading audience. Just actually to contribute to that question, um, Blair Nonicke's work from mm. 10 or so years ago looked at lurkers on Usenet newsgroups and sort of found what he estimated was an 80-20 percentage. But what I actually wanted to ask you was a follow-up question, which is uh, when Nonicke was doing that work, he found that people who were lurking in one space were almost always active in another. That is, I'm not a blogger, but I'm a Wikipedia editor. I'm not a Wikipedia editor or a blogger, but man, I'm posting photos all the time on Flickr. Mm -hmm. Did you find the same sort of thing, or are we turning into a, you know, our 90% of us sitting there staring at the wall? We actually found something very similar, and it's something I didn't get a chance to talk about too much, but the, the sort of variance between whether people interact and whether they don't, like I mentioned, it has to do with the, the relationship between the reader and the blogger, and it does highly vary. There was an example where one of our participants in the, the exploratory qualitative study was a chemistry grad student. And she read several blogs by chemistry professors, but never really commented or interacted there because, because she was also a very active knit blogger. She maintained her own knitting blog and had a huge social network of other knit blogs that she read. And so her online blog reading was basically strictly about this recreational knitting activity. And she didn't want to link that to her personal life. Um, so I think that to some extent we see the same thing here, that people who are lurking or not commenting in one area may be very active participants of another community and actively commenting in other places. Other questions? For the sake of simplicity, I'll just use readers and bloggers. Um, that, that was a great distinction to call out. Um, in your research, did you notice if readers were connecting with other readers, and to what extent? So that was something that actually varied a lot between the two studies that we did. In the first study, the, the largely exploratory one, very few people actually talked about interacting with the other readers. Um, they talked a lot about interacting with the blogger, emailing the blogger or commenting, but not so much with the other readers. In our study of people reading political blogs, there was a lot more discussion about interaction with other readers. Excuse me. So much so that some people actually said they would go to a blog and they would only read the posts that they thought would encourage interesting discussion with other readers. They would just squ skim the post quickly and then go right to the comments section. And so I, I sort of hesitate to draw any sort of broader conclusion from that. But I, I think it's because that particular community is invested and interested and engaged in having a debate. What they're there to do is interact with other people. Um, Whereas in the first study, there wasn't really this idea of interacting around a common interest or a common topic. So again, it varies, but I would, I would, I would hazard a guess that it varies largely on, along the lines of the reader's motivation, whether or not they're there to interact with other readers. Is there in the back? 
have you looked at patterns in content that cause more reader participation? So for example, what I noticed is if postings have questions on them, like what do you think or you know, what is your take, I will get more people participating with comments than when I don't. And then if I make a stupid mistake on my posting, or I suspect some people do it purposely, like a uh, fake Steve Jobs, uh, you get tons of comments. Uh, have you looked at that at all? So we didn't actually look at that focusing on that, the different factors that lead to participation or more comments or whatever. Um, from a sort of anecdotal perspective, in the, the political blog reader study, um, while we were interviewing the readers of these blogs, we ourselves, the researchers, were also reading the blogs. And one thing that we noticed that, that our participants noticed as well um, is that humor actually had a large bearing on whether or not people would comment. Posts where someone could comment by making a joke or make some kind of snarky remark, they were much more likely to have high comment counts than posts that were strictly about information or analysis or discussion. Um, that is most likely due largely to the nature of the blog that we were looking at. The, the particular blog that I'm thinking is very geared at this sort of sarcastic, witty commentary on politics. Um, and so I, I don't know if we can, if I, if I would go so far as to make any sort of generalization about what leads people to comment or what doesn't, but I would, I would, I would guess that it's not entirely in the content of the post. That whether or not people comment or interact, again, goes back to their motivations for reading. And I think that would be the key. You, you might be able to find some kind of trends if you did large-scale quantitative analysis of these different blog corpora and which ones caused more comments or this sort of thing. But I suspect that a lot of it also has to do with readers' motivations. Yep? So regarding kind of the motivations, do you have any data on uh, readers that also get sort of um, become guest bloggers? Because I know there's some cases, like my friend has a political blog, and he had a lot of readers that were so active he became them to be guest bloggers. And I also know on Met Blogs, for example, they choose certain people to be bloggers for those different cities based on their activity, their amount of stuff that they post, and how interesting and how many comments they get against it. Mm -hmm. So, of our participants that were readers, none of them mentioned ever being asked to be a guest blogger or submit a guest blog entry. Um, one of the bloggers to whom we spoke, excuse me, <clears throat> actually talked about a desire to try and find guest bloggers, but the people that he was talking about recruiting weren't his readers. They were things like his uncle, who he thought was incredibly funny, or someone with whom he worked. Um, and so, I, I mean, it might be the case that lots of guest bloggers are recruited from the readership, but we didn't see a lot of that. I'd, I'd be hard pressed to make a generalization. That's, I mean, that's another great thing that it would be good to do a large scale survey about. Who are the guest bloggers? Are they readers? Are they bloggers from other blogs? Are they just random writers who I say, hey, write me a blog post? Um, but we didn't see a lot of readers being asked to be guest bloggers. Other questions or comments? <clears throat> all right. Go ahead and thank the speaker. Thank you all. <clears throat>